the quote Marx legend, end quote, or Engels, founder of Marxism, by Maximilien Rubel. Note to the reader. In May 1970, the city of Wuppertal, German Federal Republic, organized an international scientific conference to mark the 150th anniversary of Friedrich Engels' birth. This event attracted the participation of nearly 50 Engels specialists from more than 10 European countries, Israel, and the United States. This task, well, their task was to resume modern research into the thought of this man, who was the closest friend and collaborator of Karl Marx and who is universally considered one of the founders of Marxism. I was among those invited to participate in this conference, and I submitted for discussion a paper consisting of eight critical, quote, theses, end quote, or, quote, viewpoints, end quote, centered on Engels' responsibility for the foundation of what has now become the dominant ideology of the 20th century. Because I had assumed that the celebration would be more scientific than commemorative in spirit, I thought it imperative to pass on my critical reservations to an audience of social scientists informed by the problems that have been generated during the course of this century's own particular events and upsurges by the evolution of ideas. Consequently, I sent the organizers of the conference my paper written in German and entitled Gesicht Spunkte zum Thema Engels als Begründer. My surprise was great on arriving at, in Wuppertal to be received by the conference officials who immediately informed me of our predicament. My Soviet and East German colleagues felt personally offended in reading my, quote, viewpoints, end quote, and threatened to leave the conference unless my contributions were withdrawn from the debates. After tedious negotiations, we came upon a formula that seemed to mitigate the irritation of the, quote, scientific, end quote, representatives from the so-called socialist countries. Henceforth, the papers would no longer be read from the podium, but simply commented upon, upon and discussed. There is little interest in recounting here the details of the debate provoked by the, quote, viewpoints, end quote. The objections made against them were wholly void of any scientific, quote, scientific, end quote, quality while the conduct of certain participants portrayed their categorical refusal to engage in any discussion that might engender doubts about the scheme of ideological positions known as Marxism-Leninism. Moreover, this obstinate, if not simply insulting refusal of discussion was an adequate confirmation of the validity of my critique of the use of the concept of Marxism. I conceived of my, quote, viewpoints, end quote, precisely as a denunciation of the illogical use of this concept of the fanaticism and mythology to which it is attached. The epilogue to the conference again emphasized the relevance of my denunciation, which through a simple exercise in semantics actually defends Marx's social theory against Marxist mythology. The organizers did not scruple to violate the elementary rules of editing policy generally respected in bourgeois democratic states. The text that had been submitted at the request of the officials was not included in the volume dedicated to the contributions received in advance of the conference. Habent sua fata libelli. The following is an English rendition amplified by a number of comments of the German manuscript that was turned down by the organizers of the Wuppertal Conference. Viewpoints on the theme of, quote, Engels as founder of Marxism, end quote. Quote, for the ultimate triumph of the ideas set forth in the manifesto, Marx relied solely and exclusively on the intellectual development of the working class as it would necessarily ensue from the united action and discussion, end quote. Preface to the 1890 German edition of the Communist Manifesto by Friedrich Engels. Section 1. Marxism is not an original product of the Marxian way of thought, but was conceived in the mind of Friedrich Engels. 
Insofar as the term, quote, Marxism, end quote, embraces a theoretically apprehensible subject matter, the responsibility lies not with Marx but with Engels. Moreover, if the problem of understanding Marx is still an actual concern in today's world, it is for the most part related to questions that Engels resolved only partially or not at all. If these questions admit of an answer, it is only by returning directly to Marx that we can find it. This is not to say that Engels should be excluded from the current discussion on Marx, but we may justly ask if and to what extent Engels' statements should be taken into account in dealing with writings of Marx that entirely escaped his friend. Engels' Attention In more general terms, what is the extent of Engels' competence as the unchallenged executor of Marx's intellectual legacy in answering the material and intellectual questions evoked by Marx's writings? Section 2. The interrogation, this interrogation leads us to examine a central topic, that of the intellectual relationship between Marx and Engels, both of whom are considered to be the, quote, founders, end quote, of a contradictory system of political ideologies and concepts with scientific pretensions artificially subsumed under the label of Marxism. That this problem is today more urgent than ever points to a phenomenon highly characteristic of our era that may be termed 20th century constructions in mythology. The, quote, founders, end quote, themselves referred more than once to mythological figures when characterizing the particular nature of their friendship and intellectual collaborations. Friendship and intellectual collaboration. Marx had ironically invoked the example of the, quote, Dioscuris, end quote, and the Orestes and Pylades. Engels was amused by the rumor that, quote, Ariman Marx had led or moved Engels, end quote, astray of the path of virtue. The opposite is equally possible. Efforts have been made, and with increasing frequency, to oppose Marx and Engels. The former is held to have been the true founder, the second merely a pseudo a quote pseudo dialectician end quote. Three, section three. If we are to investigate the relations between Marx and Engels, we will make no progress until we rid ourselves of the legend of a foundation and until we recognize in the rationally indefinable concept of Marxism our methodological point of departure. To his great merit, Karl Korsch, whose essay is, who's, who I just, loaded, I just uploaded a bunch of Karl Korsch essays, so you know, if you want to check those out, you should. To his great merit, Karl Korsch submitted Marxism to a critical examination 20 years ago prior to a radical revision of his own intellectual positions. Although this critique was so severe as to verge on belligerency, Korsh left it unfinished, for he failed to liberate the concept of Marxism from its mythological elements. Instead, Korsh tried to remove the difficulty by using linguistic artifices designed to save important aspects of the Marxian doctrine for the, quote, reconstruction of a revolutionary theory and praxis, end quote. In Ten Theses on Marxism Today, Korsh speaks at random of the, quote, teaching of Marx and Engels, end quote, quote, Marxist doctrine, end quote, quote, Marx's doctrine, end quote, Marxism, end quote, and so forth. In the fifth thesis concerning the predecessors, founders and continuators of the socialist movement, Korsh omits the name of Engels, Marx's so-called alter ego, he was not far from discovering the essence of the problem, however, in writing that, quote, all of the attempts to reestablish Marxist teachings as an entity and restore them in their primary function as the theory of social revolution for the working class have to date proved to be reactionary utopias, end quote. Karl Korsch might well have spoken, and more appropriately of, quote, erratic mythologies, end quote, rather than, quote, reactionary utopias, end quote.
Section 4. The impossibility of finding a rational definition of the concept of Marxism leads us consequently to abandon the term despite its frequent and universal usage. The word has been abused so flagrantly that today it is no more than a mystifying catchword and indeed it has borne the stigma of confusion since its inception. Toward the end of his life, as he began to acquire a certain reputation for his theoretical and scientific work, Marx engaged in a sustained effort to divorce himself from this concept and repeatedly and preemptorily declared, quote, All I know is that I am not a Marxist. End quote. It is to Engels' credit that he passed on this pretentious warning to their sectarian disciples and to posterity, yet this does not relieve Engels of the responsibility for having ultimately sanctioned the term, quote, Marxist, end quote, end quote, Marxism, end quote, with his authority, as guardian and continuator of a theory that he recognized as having been, quote, discovered, end quote, and elaborated by someone other than himself. He was convinced that in glorifying Marx's name, he would be writing a wrong. In so doing, however, Engels promoted the development of a myth whose devastating intellectual consequences he had no means he had by no means anticipated. Today, we can measure the full effect of his questionable consecration. When Engels decided to adopt the designations quote, Marxist end quote end quote, Marxism, end quote, forged by his and Marx's adversaries as pejoratives for use in moments of polemic, and to put the followers of, quote, scientific socialism, end quote, in defiance of their adversaries by transforming these terms into titles of glory. He hardly expected that his act of defiance, or was it resignation, made him the spiritual father of a mythology destined to dominate the history of the 20th century. Section 5. We can trace the genesis of the Marxist myth beginning with the conflicts within the International Workingmen's Association that provoked the pejorative use of this term. In the early 1870s, Marx's opponents in the International Workingmen's Association, the quote, anti-authoritarians, end quote, headed by Bukunin, were sufficiently motivated in their fight against Marx's influence to create terms such as Marxides, Marxistis and Marxism, with which they culminated their adversaries and his supporters. Their adversary and his supporters. The anti authoritarians' adversaries, adversaries and Marx's supporters. The word, quote, Marxism, end quote, seems to have been used for the first time in the title of a writing in 1882 when Paul Bruce published his polemic brochure entitled Le Marxisme dans l'international, tried my best, which attacked the, quote, Marxist, end quote, in the French Socialist Party. Gradually, however, the French disciples grew accustomed to the new titles, which they had done nothing to create, and helped develop them from sectarian labels to concepts which, with political and ideological content. At the outset, Engels appeared to have been disinclined to use such terminology. More than anyone else, Engels was aware that it risked corrupting the essential meanings of Marx's writings, which Marx himself considered to be the theoretical expression of an actual social movement, and in no sense a doctrine invented by an individual for the use of political and in, for of a political and intellectual elite. Engels resisted the temptation to use such terms until 1889, when the dissensions between possibilists and Bruceists, in on the one side, and collectivist or Gettists on the other threatened to cause a definitive rupture in the French working class movement. Engels recognized the manifest danger in employing the terms, quote, Marxist, end quote, Marxism, and therefore attempted to forestall the risk of confusion and ideological corruption by using quotation marks around them or speaking of the, quote, so called Marxist, end quote. When Paul Lafargue expressed 
his fear that their group would come to be known as just one, quote, faction, end quote, Marxist, within the working class movement, Engels replied, quote, we never called you anything but the, quote, so-called Marxist, end quote, and I wouldn't know what else to call you. If you have another name just as short, let us hear it and we shall duly apply it with pleasure, end quote, Engels. Section 6. If Nietzsche published Ecce Homo to prevent unwanted disciples from canonizing him one day, for Marx such a precaution did not appear to be necessary, although he had not been able to finish and to publish more than a fragment of his planned works. All of his printed and unprinted writings alone represent a formal and rigorous interdiction. Marx's name was not to be given to the cause for which he had fought and to the teaching that he had believed himself mandated to elaborate in the name of the anonymous masses of modern proletarians. Had Engels respected this interdiction, he would have vetoed the use of Marx's name and Marxism that fatal worldwide ersatz religion might never have come into being. However, Engels committed the inexcusable error of approving this abuse and thus acquired the doubtful honor of being the first Marxist. Although he thought himself to be Marx's heir, Engels was in fact the founder of the Marxist school, albeit involuntarily, and we are tempted to see in this the revenge of history. Indeed, destiny seems to have played a bad trick on Engels, with the same irony that he often took pleasure in invoking. In spite of himself, Engels proved to be prophetic in writing the following words relative to a celebration in honor of his 70th birthday. Quote, My fate would have it that I harvest the honor and glory sown by a man who was much greater than I, Karl Marx. End quote. On his 150th birthday, we are obliged to accord Engels the problematic honor and rank of, quote, founder of Marxism, end quote. Section 7. Engels occupied the forefront in the history of Marxism as the cult of Marx. The human quasi-religious aspect of Engels' friendship with Marx is sufficiently well known for us to dispense with a special examination of their relations. By contrast, we should investigate in detail the effects of his behavior on Marx on his followers and more distant disciples. In his desire to act as a pioneer of Marx's ideas, Engels wrote much that Marx no doubt was unable to accept uncritically. However, Marx kept silent on these occasions out of respect for the friendship that bound them in solidarity until the last. We have no way of knowing whether Marx accepted all that Engels thought independently, for instance, regarding the, quote, dialectics of nature, end quote. Nevertheless, this problem is relatively minor, for we do know that Marx admitted admiration for his friend's talents and even considered himself to be Engels' disciple. What Marx did not permit himself to do has therefore become a strict duty for those who are studying the works of both men. The task is to break the spell of the mythology surrounding Marx and discover the role of Engels' writings both in developing the intellectual heritage of socialism and in det determining the course of the working class movement. Section 8. Only if we recognize that Engels had the making the makings of a founder, is it possible to understand why Engels worked at his tasks as editor and continuator of Marx's writings in a way that offers today, more than ever before, serious grounds for criticism? Engels neglected or overlooked a whole series of Marx's writings, such as the preliminary writings for the doctoral dissertation, the Kreuznach critique of the Hegelian philosophy of right, the Paris and Brussels manuscripts, the voluminous first draft of the, quote, economics, end quote, dating from 1857 to 1858, Grundrisse, numerous study notebooks, and his correspondence with third parties, which present new problems of interpretation to the researcher and specialist. What is more, they interest new categories and generations of readers who no longer can and should content themselves with the stereotyped phraseology and orthodoxy of professional Marxists. Their interest is heightened by the imperative of understanding, living and acting in an era which 
in which ideology, mechanization, and the manipulation of mind and consciousness are associated with political power and pure violence, changing the modern world into a veil of tears. Um, conclusion. I guess that's what that means. Fancy S. Does that mean conclusion or summary or... Um, I don't know. I'm not fancy. <laughs> I'm going to start saying whatever I say something wrong. I'm going to say I'm not fancy. These points are intended as an introduction to a debate to be oriented around the problem of Marxism as the mythology of our modern era. The question of Engel's responsibility in creating this universal process of mystification is of course part of this debate. Yet secondary, if we recognize the validity of Marx's lesson in materialism, which tells us that ideologies, of which Marxism in all its variants and offshoots is one, do not appear as bolts from the blue. They are basically dependent on class interests, which are power interests. If we acknowledge Engel's claim to the Marxian intellectual legacy as legitimate, no other justification is necessary to denounce in his name and to his honor all forms of institutionalized Marxism, a school of confusion and illusions for our cataclysm, for our cla cataclysmic iron, <laughs> for, for our cataclysmic age of iron. <laughs>